Orthodox worship seems to be the height of formality, the epitome of fossilized ritual. The major elements of the Sunday morning service have not significantly changed in over 1,600 years. Now, for the average Protestant, that fact alone would be enough to condemn Orthodox liturgy. How can that kind of worship represent anything but empty, anachronistic, legalistic religion? It's certainly not what I was looking for. As someone who all my adult life was intimately involved in leading the worship experience, I know something about modern Protestant worship. What the Protestant is looking for and what pastors and worship leaders are hoping to provide is a worship experience that is meaningful. What does meaningful mean? First, the music needs to inspire people to feel love and devotion for God and allow them the opportunity to express those feelings. Secondly, the sermon needs to give them something fresh and meaty to ponder, something that will inspire the congregation to follow God. If I'm sitting in the pews, my goal is to get something out of this, to find godly joy and inspiration. What do I need in order for that to happen? Just what the leaders are trying to give me. Good music and a good sermon. So what happens if the music isn't that great, or it's not the style that I prefer? What if the preacher isn't very dynamic, or constantly speaks over my head or under my head? Well, then the worship experience won't be what I'd hoped for. If this problem persists from week to week, I may find it easy just to stay home, or to go to the beach and commune with God in that great cathedral of the outdoors. If I'm a more committed Christian, I'll eventually decide that it's time to go somewhere else and to see if a different church can give me the worship music and the solid sermons that I need in order to grow in the Lord. Having lived in both worlds, I can tell you the critical difference between Protestant worship and Orthodox worship. Simply put, Protestants come to church primarily to learn something about God. Orthodox faithful, on the other hand, come to worship God. Now don't get me wrong, what a Protestant wants to get from worship is something of a spiritual nature. He comes to receive godly inspiration from the music and the teaching. But something different motivates the Orthodox worshiper. He comes to church mainly out of a simple obedience to the holy God who calls for our adoration. The point that needs to be grasped by the Protestant who wants to understand liturgical worship is this. When the primary goal of a worshiper is to gain inspiration, ritual worship may seem pointless. But when his objective is to give obedient reverence, ritual worship is the only type of worship that makes any sense. After all, it's obvious that you can't be perfectly obedient to someone unless that person gives you clear, straightforward directions to obey. This is especially true in the case of erring human creatures who are seeking to obey God. For our sakes, the Lord must be specific about what he wants. What's more, because of our sinful ignorance, he cannot constantly change his directions. With this in mind, let me contrast the Protestant and Orthodox experience more carefully. A Protestant attends church in hope that something will happen, at least on most Sundays, to stir him. Excellent music might be enough to accomplish that, but what the Protestant worshiper really needs is for the pastor to give him something to think about that he's never thought about before, something that will make God come alive in his soul. From a rationalist point of view, it's obvious that a person can't stay inspired unless he hears something new, or hears something that he's heard before, but in a more fresh and stimulating way. Once again, the Protestant religious experience starts in the mind. That being the case, ritual worship is not going to help. 
How is worship that's essentially the same every single time going to stimulate me with new things to think about? I have to receive fresh, inspiring input in order to live for God and to grow spiritually. So liturgical worship is out. I need something more moving, something more meaningful. Thus, at the end of each Sunday service, Protestant ministers and lay people always have a judgment call to make. How meaningful was the service? Were the minister and worship team in tune with God, making it a great day? Was it just spiritually mediocre? Does the church board really need to make some changes in personnel? Some weeks the answers are positive, Sometimes they're not, but any honest Protestant will tell you that the worship does not pass muster until these judgments have been made. When I was a Protestant minister, a woman that I knew worked as a hostess in a popular after-church restaurant. One day she told me that any time I wanted to know how good a job my fellow pastors around town were doing, I could just ask her. Sometimes they're on pedestals, she observes, but most of the time they're on crosses. Of course, in evaluating the pastor over lunch, Protestant believers are demonstrating how much is riding on their need for inspiration. If the pastor and the choir aren't providing it, they feel that their spiritual lives are stagnating. They worry about that. Now, can you imagine attending a church where the power and effectiveness of the worship experience do not depend primarily upon the creative excellences of the pastor or the choir, where the worship can be fulfilling every time. This is orthodox worship. Why is it that way? It's precisely because it is liturgical, and that because its primary motivation is the right worship of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let me briefly describe to you my typical Sunday morning experience as an Orthodox Christian. First of all, we skip breakfast, even coffee. The church has always fasted before the Eucharist in the anticipation of receiving, as the first food of the day, the body and blood of Christ. As I leave for church, there is one thought, one objective in my mind. Today I will give praise and honor to Christ, for he calls me to come meet with him, to be united with him. There is no anxiety, not even the hint of a question about whether it will be meaningful. It will, because nothing can hinder it. Of course, it's true that my perception of its meaning can be hindered if I am an inattentive, or if I come to worship with a heart that's not been cleansed of sin, But that fault is mine, not the liturgies or those who celebrate it. Why do I have that confidence? Strange as it may sound, it's because the Holy Spirit will make this occur through the service itself, not primarily through those who perform it. The church's liturgical worship, you see, is not the invention of men. It is a gift that the church received in its infancy from the Spirit who would lead her into all truth. The liturgical services of the church are the embodiment of Christ's directions to his apostles as to how we must worship him. Now again, I know my Protestant reader is not going to just accept that assertion immediately. He can certainly discover its truth if he'd like, just like I did, But what I ask the reader to do at this point is to at least grant this. If the liturgy is God-given, then all of the beautiful things that I'm going to say about it next would have to be absolutely true. I would also ask my Protestant reader to entertain this thought. Doesn't the worship that I'm describing here really sound like the way that worship ought to be? The Orthodox Christian worships in an environment where God himself directs the acts of worship. The Protestant, on the other hand, must hope that God can somehow inspire people to create meaningful acts of worship. Can you grasp the great difference? When God defines the acts, sinful erring people can't get in the way of their success. And when the acts that he requires to be performed are always the same, His worshipers can never be confused or be led into false worship by the ever-subtle enemy. 
When worship is like this, wonderful things happen. Think about it. Every prayer the worshipers raise must be answered because God himself has declared what shall be petitioned. Every song will be to his glory, for he has ordained the words. Every act will be in submission to his spirit, for he has declared what shall be done. So when an Orthodox Christian faithfully and willingly does what God asks, his worship is full of God. But there is a paradox here. When an Orthodox Christian comes to liturgical worship obediently and participates wholeheartedly, he also ends up getting the inspiration for which the Protestant so sincerely longs. So as an Orthodox believer, the thought, will the service be good today, never enters my mind. The question, will I be inspired by church today, never enters my mind. The service is always good. The worship is always right. And whether I get inspired or not is entirely up to me. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't some days when the choir doesn't sing better than others. Some priests have much better voices for chanting in the liturgy than others. And some are better preachers. Certainly, beautiful singing and clear preaching do make for a more aesthetically pleasing liturgy than poor singing and preaching. But the beauty and power of the Spirit-inspired liturgy is this. Feeble and undependable human agents cannot stand between God's people and an experience of the fullness of God's blessing. For the intimacy of our moments with God is not riding on the thrilling quality of the music or on the originality of sermons. The power of the liturgy is not found in the talents of the priests and the singers. The power of the liturgy is found within the sacramental acts performed in it. All the priests and singers must do is present the liturgy, opening the way for us to come to the sacrament with faith and obedient adoration. This is why liturgical worship is the only kind of worship that God has ever ordained, The chosen people of Israel worshipped liturgically. We learned that in our evangelical Bible training. Nowhere in the Old Testament did they ever just wing it in the temple. Therefore, liturgical worship was also the only kind of worship that the apostles knew. My old belief that the worship of early church was similar to that of home fellowship groups was really nonsensical. The apostles could not have conceived of such a worship nor did the Holy Spirit teach it to them. He altered only the object of their worship. Christ, especially through the celebration of his Eucharist, becomes the centerpiece of Christian liturgy. Let me return to my Sunday morning ritual. When I enter the church, I step into heaven. Literally. Mystically, yes, but nevertheless, literally. The sanctuary of an Orthodox church is patterned on the descriptions of heaven found in the books of Isaiah and Revelation. There is the altar, the throne of God. With it are the lampstands and the incense that those scriptural passages describe. Surrounding the throne are angels and saints, whom I see through the windows of their icons. Every time I walk through the door of the sanctuary, I am swept into the holy river of worship that is always flowing there. Just by entering that sanctuary, I am humbled. My heart and my eyes are opened, and I begin to see that I have indeed come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through 24. In the midst of this glorious scene, I stand, ready obediently to worship my Creator and God. Then the priest cries, Blessed is the kingdom.
And the whole congregation sings. Amen. Thus begins a sublime worship, which is almost entirely chanted and sung. The priest and congregation sing beautiful prayers, the priest making supplication, the congregation responding after each line with, Lord have mercy sounding like this. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from on high and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Hymns of praise as old as the church itself are lifted in holy joy. With ceremonious honor and reverence, the epistle and gospel are read. Then there is a pause in the singing as the priest gives a homily or a sermon on the gospel reading. In some churches, the homily is given at the end of liturgy. Usually, the emphasis of the priest's homily is on teaching the people how to live according to the words that they have just heard. This first part of the service is called the liturgy of the word. When the homily is finished, the prayers and hymns begin anew. Now we move into the Eucharistic liturgy. The focus shifts to the miraculous and holy event that is about to occur. In the songs and prayers, we hear deep humility, repentance, and trembling gratitude as Christ comes as both the offerer and the offering of the Eucharist. We profess the Nicene Creed, as Christians have done for over 1,600 years. We pray that Christ will forgive us and mercifully allow us unworthy ones to receive his transforming body and blood. Then, stepping forth from the altar bearing the Eucharist, the priest exclaims, With fear of God, with faith and love, draw near. The faithful go forward, and receive from the same chalice the holy gifts of Christ's presence. Afterward, the hymns swell with awesome thanksgiving and praise. Under a multitude of blessings, those empowered by the enlivening spirit go forth to live lives of chastity, prayer, fasting, holiness, lives of oneness with the Redeemer who has given them his life. When faithful Orthodox Christians meet for coffee or lunch after the service, they really have nothing to complain about because their worship is liturgical and not innovative. There is nothing that the priest or the choir, be it singing beautiful or not so beautiful, could have done to prevent them from meeting God. They know that they have received the blessing of Christ's enlivening body and blood in the Eucharist. All that intimate union and communion with God can be, they have touched and tasted in worship. What a world of difference that there is between the modern Protestant services. Still, my Protestant reader may be concerned that no matter how glorious and moving the Divine Liturgy may be, worship that is the same from week to week cannot possibly foster growth in God. After all, doesn't growth require change? That seems to be a law everywhere, in the natural world and in the spiritual. Sameness and worship would seem to inspire stagnation and not development. Absolutely, growth requires change. Spiritual growth especially demands it, because there is so much in us that is sinful that needs alteration. 
The big question is, how does spiritual refinement occur in an individual and what kind of worship would be best to promote that process? I think an Orthodox Christian and a Protestant would agree that the goal of spiritual growth must be to become like Christ. How, though, does one determine what kind of worship encourages that spiritual evolution? It seems clear that for one's worship to make him like Jesus, the believer's worship must reflect Christ our God, who he is, what he does. He is love. He is the Redeemer. He is the Creator. He orders all things. All creation serves and honors him. He is also changeless. In him, St. James says, is no variation or shadow of turning. In James chapter 1, verse 17. The writer of Hebrews, according to the Orthodox tradition, St. Paul, reminds us that, quote, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. It is evident that these characteristics are reflected dynamically in the divine liturgy. Love stands as its centerpiece in the form of the Holy Eucharist, the celebration of the awesome and merciful sacrifice of Christ. Every act within the liturgy has been created and ordered by the Spirit of God, not by his creatures. By its nature, the liturgy requires everyone present, priest and layman alike, to actively and humbly participate in honoring the triune God. In its eminent constancy, no essential alterations in 16 centuries, it serves as an incredible example of God's invariable nature. The liturgy bears brightly the express image of the Godhead. But what about contemporary Protestant worship? Whereas in the Orthodox Church, the focal point is the altar, at the center of the Protestant service is the pulpit. The main thrust is preaching and teaching. Good things to be sure, but it's not worship. The details of the service are as changeable as the desires and tastes of those who create them and bear little resemblance to historical biblical worship. Very little participation is required from the congregation, who might just as well be referred to as the audience. In fact, the place of assembly is often called the auditorium or the listening post. The service's success or failure is judged by how well those who officiate perform in pleasing the congregation. I finally came to realize that when I was Protestant, I judged the quality of worship by what it did for me, not what it did to exalt God. The question, did I offer to God every obedience that he asked of me today, almost never entered my mind. Having no specific understanding of how God's people had always worshiped, I could not have answered it anyway. Rather, I gauged the effectiveness of my worship experience by how inspiring it was for me. Given my rationalism, which is driven by the desire for new information, I couldn't measure it any other way. Liturgical worship is like a refining fire. It never goes out. God shines forth in it, in all his glory. When I come to it, I must yield to the God who is revealed in it. I speak the words he commands. I sing the songs he calls forth. I pray the prayers he enjoins me to pray. What he desires, I must adhere to. What he wants done, I must do. There is no room for concern over myself or my wants. What is this worship other than an opportunity for me to become like Christ? 